Our first story tonight will be chapter 14, Millie Molly Mandy's Mother Goes Away. Once upon a time, Millie Mandy... <laughs> Once upon a time, Millie Molly Mandy's mother went away from the nice white cottage with the thatched roof for a whole fortnight's holiday. Millie Molly Mandy's mother hardly ever went away for holidays. In fact, Millie Molly Mandy could only remember her going away once before a long time ago, and that was only for two days. Miss Hooker, mother's friend in the next town, invited her. Miss Hooker wanted to have a holiday by the sea, and she didn't want to go alone, as it isn't so much fun. So she wrote and asked mother to come with her. When Mother read the letter first, she said it was very kind of Miss Hooker, but she couldn't possibly go, as she didn't see how ever Father and Grandpa and Grandma and Uncle and Auntie and Millie Molly Mandy would get on without her to cook dinners for them and to wash clothes for them and to see after things. But Auntie said that she could manage to do the cooking and the washing somehow, and Grandma said that she could do Auntie's sweeping and dusting, and Millie Molly Mandy said she would help all she knew how and father and grandpa and uncle said that they wouldn't be fussy or make any more work than they could help. And then they all begged mother to write to Mrs. Hooker and accept. So mother did, and she was quite excited, and so was Millie Molly Mandy for her. Then mother bought a new hat and a blouse and a sunshade, and she packed them all in her best trunk with all her best things, and Millie Molly Mandy helping. And then she kissed Grandpa and Grandma and Uncle and Auntie goodbye and hugged Millie Molly Mandy. And then Father drove her to, in the pony trap to the next town, to the station, to meet Miss Hooker and to go with her by train to the sea. She kissed Father goodbye at the station. And so Father and Grandpa and Grandma and Uncle and Auntie and Millie Molly Mandy had to manage as best they could in the nice white cottage with the thatched roof for a whole fortnight without Mother and it did feel queer. Millie Molly Mandy kept forgetting, and she would run in from school to tell Mother all about something and find it was Auntie in Mother's apron bending over the kitchen stove instead of Mother herself. And Father would put his head in at the kitchen door and say, Polly, will you? And then suddenly remember that Polly was having a lovely holiday by the sea. Polly was Mother's other name, of course. And they felt so pleased when they remembered. But it did seem a long time to wait till she came back. Then one day father said, I've got a plan. Don't you think it would be a good idea while Polly's away if we were to... And then father told them all his plan. And grandpa and grandma and uncle and auntie thought it was a very fine plan. And so did Millie Molly Mandy. But I mustn't tell you what it was, because it is to be a surprise. And you know how secrets do get about when you start telling them. But I'll just tell you this that they made the kitchen and the scullery in the passage outside the kitchen most dreadfully untidy, so that nothing was in its proper place. And they had to have meals like picnics, only not so nice, though Millie Molly Mandy thought it was all quite fun. Well, they all worked awfully hard at the plan in their spare time. Nobody really minded having things all upset, because it was such fun to think how surprised Mother would be when she came back. Then another day, Grandpa said, There's something I've been meaning to do for some time to please Polly. I suppose it would be a good plan to set about now. It is. And then Grandpa told them all his plan. And Father and Grandma and Uncle and Auntie thought it was a very fine plan, and so did Millie Molly Mandy. But I mustn't tell you what it was. Though I will just tell you this, that Grandpa was very busy digging up things in the garden and planting them again, and bringing things home in the box at the back of the pony trap on market day, and Millie Molly Mandy helped all she could. Then Uncle had a plan, and Father and Grandpa and Grandma and Auntie thought it was a very fine plan, and so did Millie Molly Mandy. It's a secret, remember? But I will just tell you this, that Uncle got a lot of bits of wood and nails and a hammer, and he was very busy in the evening after he had shut up his chickens for the night, which he called putting them to bed. Then Grandma and Auntie had a plan, and Father and Grandpa and Uncle thought it was a very fine plan, and so did Millie Molly Mandy. But I can only just tell you this, that Grandma and Auntie and Millie Molly Mandy, who helped too, made themselves very untidy and dusty indeed, and nobody had any cakes for tea at all that week, what with Auntie being so busy and the kitchen so upset. But nobody really minded, because it was such fun to think how pleased Mother would be when she came back. And then the day arrived when Mother returned home. 
They had all been working so hard in the nice white cottage with the thatched roof that the two weeks had simply flown. But they had just managed to get things straight again, and Auntie had baked a cake for tea, and Millie Molly Mandy had put flowers in all the vases. When Father helped Mother down from the pony trap, it almost didn't seem as if it could be Mother at first. But of course it was, only she had on her new hat, and she was so brown with sitting on the beach, and so very pleased to be home again. She kissed them all round and just hugged Millie Molly Mandy, and then they led her indoors. And directly Mother got inside the doorway. She saw a beautiful new passage, all clean and painted, and she was surprised. And then she went upstairs and took off her things and came back down into the kitchen, and directly Mother got inside the door, she saw a beautiful new kitchen, all clean and sunny, with the ceiling whitewashed and the walls freshly painted, and she was surprised. When they had had tea, Auntie's cake was very good, though not quite like Mother's. She helped to carry the cups and the plates out into the scullery, and directly Mother got through the doorway, she saw a beautiful new scullery, all clean and whitewashed, and she was surprised. She put the cups down on the draining board, and directly she looked out of the window, she saw a beautiful new flower garden, just outside, and a rustic trellis work hiding the dustbin, and she was surprised. Then Mother went upstairs to unpack, and when her trunk was cleared, Grandpa carried it up to the attic, and Mother went first to open the door, and directly she opened it, Mother saw a beautifully tidy, spring-cleaned attic. And then Mother couldn't say anything but that they were all very dear, naughty people to have worked so hard while she was being lazy. And Father and Grandpa and Grandma and Uncle and Auntie and Millie Molly Mandy were all very pleased and said that they liked being naughty. Then Mother brought out the presents she had got for them, and what do you think Millie Molly Mandy's present was, besides some shells that Mother had picked up on the sand? It was a beautiful little blue dressing gown, which Mother had sewed and sewed for her while she sat on the beach and under her new sunshade with Mrs. Hooker listening to the waves splashing. Then Father and Grandpa and Grandma and Uncle and Auntie and Millie Molly Mandy all said Mother was very naughty to have been working when she might have been having a nice lazy time. But Mother said she liked being naughty too, and Millie Molly Mandy was so pleased with her new little blue dressing gown that she couldn't help wearing it straight away. And then Mother put on her apron and insisted on setting to work to make them something nice for supper, so that she should feel that she was really at home. For it had been a perfect holiday, said Mother, but it was really like having another one, to come home again to them all at the nice white cottage with the thatched roof. All right, chapter 15, Millie Molly Mandy Goes to the Sea. Once upon a time, what do you think? Millie Molly Mandy was going to be taken to the seaside. Millie Molly Mandy had never seen the sea in all her life before, and ever since Mother came back from her seaside holiday with her friend Mrs. Hooker and told Millie Molly Mandy about the splashy waves and the sand and the little crabs, Millie Molly Mandy had just longed to go there herself. Father and mother and grandpa and grandma and uncle and auntie just longed for her to go too, because they all know she would, knew she would like it so much. But they were all so busy, and then, you know, holidays cost quite a lot of money. So Millie Molly Mandy played seaside instead, by the little brook in the meadow, with little friend Susan and Billy Blunt and the shells Mother had brought home for her. And it was a very nice game indeed, but still Millie Molly Mandy did wish sometimes that she, it could be the real sea. Then one day, little friend Susan went with her mother and baby sister to stay with a relative who let lodgings by the sea, and little friend Susan wrote Millie Molly Mandy a postcard saying how lovely it was and how she did wish Millie Molly Mandy was there. And Mrs. Moggs wrote mother a postcard saying, couldn't some of them manage to come down just for a day excursion one Saturday? Father and mother and grandpa and grandma and uncle and auntie thought something really ought to be done about that, and they all talked it over while Millie Molly Mandy listened with all her ears. But Father said he couldn't go, because he had to get his potatoes up. And Mother said she couldn't go because it was baking day, and besides, she had just had a lovely seaside holiday. Grandpa said he couldn't go because it was market day. Grandma said she wasn't really very fond of train journeys. And Uncle said he oughtn't to leave his cows and his chickens. But they all said that Auntie could quite well leave the sweeping and the dusting for that one day. So Auntie only said that it seemed too bad that she should have all the fun. 
and then she and Millie Molly Mandy hugged each other because it was so very exciting. Millie Molly Mandy ran off to tell Billy Blunt at once because she felt she would burst if she didn't tell somebody. And Billy Blunt did wish he could be going too, but his father and mother were always busy. Millie Molly Mandy told Auntie, and Auntie said, tell Billy Blunt to ask his mother to let him come with us, and I'll see after him. So Billy Blunt did, and Mrs. Blunt said it was very kind of Auntie, and she'd be glad to let him go. Millie Molly Mandy hoppity skipped like anything, because she was so very pleased. And Billy Blunt was very pleased too, though he didn't hoppity skipped, because he always thought he was really too old for such things. But he wasn't really. So now they were able to plan together for Saturday which made it much more fun. Mother had an old bathing dress which she cut down to fit Millie Molly Mandy, and the bits over she made into a flower for the shoulder, and indeed it looked a very smart bathing dress indeed. Billy B Blunt borrowed a swimming suit from another boy at school, but it hadn't had any flower on the shoulder, of course not. Then Billy Blunt said to Millie Molly Mandy, if you've got swimming suits, you ought to swim. We'd better practice. But Millie Molly Mandy said, we haven't got enough water. Billy Blunt said, practice in the air then. Better than nothing. So they fetched two old boxes from the barn out in the yard and then lay on them on their fronts and spread out their arms and kicked with their legs just as if they were swinging. And when Uncle came along to fetch a wheelbarrow, he said it really made him feel quite cool to see them. He showed them how to turn their hands properly and kept calling out, steady, steady, not so fast, as he watched them. And then Uncle lay on his front on the box and showed them how, and he looked so funny. And they tried again, and Uncle said it was better that time. So they practiced until they were quite out of breath. Then they pretended to dive off the boxes, and they splashed and swallowed mouthfuls of air, and swam races to the gate, and shivered and dried themselves with old sacks, and it was almost as much fun as if it were real water. Well, Saturday came at last, and Auntie and Millie Molly Mandy met Billy Blunt at nine o'clock by the crossroads. Then they went in the red bus to the station in the next town, and then they went in the train, rumpity-tump, rumpity-tump, all the way down to the sea. And you can't imagine how exciting it was when they got out there at last to walk down a road knowing they would see the real sea at the bottom. Millie Molly Mandy got so excited that she didn't want to look till they were quite up close. So Billy Blunt, who had seen it once before, pulled her right along to the edge of the sand, and then he said suddenly, Now look! And Millie Molly Mandy looked. And there was the sea, all jumping with sparkles in the sunshine, as far as ever you could see. And little friend Susan, with bare legs and frock tucked up, came tearing over the sand to meet them from where Mrs. Moggs and Baby Moggs were sitting by a wooden breakwater. Wasn't it fun? They took off their shoes and their socks and their hats, and they wanted to take off their clothes and bathe, but Auntie said bathe, but Auntie said they must have dinner first. So they sat round and ate sandwiches and cakes and fruit which Auntie had brought in a basket, and the Moggs had theirs too out of a basket. Then they played in the sand with baby Moggs, who liked having her legs buried, and paddled a bit and found crabs. They didn't take them away from the water, though. Then Auntie and Mrs. Moggs said they might bathe now if they wanted to. So, as it was a very quiet sort of beach, Millie Molly Mandy undressed behind Auntie, and little friend Susan undressed behind Mrs. Moggs, and Billy Brunt undressed behind the breakwater. And then they ran right into the water in their bathing dresses. And little friend Susan thought Millie Molly Mandy's bathing dress was smart, with the flower on the shoulder. But, dear me... Water swimming feels so different from land swimming. And Millie Molly Mandy couldn't manage with at all well with the little waves splashing at her all the time. Billy Blunt swished about in the water with a very grim face and looked exactly as if he were swimming. But when Millie Molly Mandy asked him, he said, No, my arms swim, but my legs only walk. It was queer, for it had seemed quite easy in the barnyard. But they went on pretending and pretending to swim until Auntie called them out, and then they dried themselves with towels and got into their clothes again, and Billy Blunt said, well, anyhow, he supposed they were just that much nearer to swimming properly than they were before. And Millie Molly Mandy said she supposed next time they might perhaps be able to lift their feet off the ground for a minute at any rate. And little friend Susan said she was sure that she had swallowed a shrimp, but that was only her fun. Then they played and explored among the rock pools and had tea on the sand. And after tea, M Mrs. Moggs and Baby Moggs and little friend Susan walked with them back to the station. And Auntie and Millie Molly Mandy and Billy Blunt went in the train, rumpity-tump, rumpity-tump, all the way home again. 
And Millie Molly Mandy was so sleepy when she got to the nice white cottage with the thatched roof that she only had just time to kiss father and mother and grandpa and grandma and uncle and auntie goodnight and to get into bed before she fell fast asleep. All right, continuing on with chapter 16, Millie Molly Mandy Minds a Baby. Once upon a time, Millie Molly Mandy had to mind a tiny little baby. It was the funniest tiny little baby that you could possibly imagine, and Millie Molly Mandy had to mind it because there didn't seem anybody else to do so. She couldn't find its mother or its father or any of its relations, so she had to take it home and look after it herself because, of course, you can't leave a tiny little baby alone in the woods with no one anywhere to look after it. And this was how it happened. Millie Molly Mandy wanted some acorn cups, which are useful for making dolls bowls and wheel ball, wheels for matchbox carts and all that sort of thing, you know. So his little friend Susan was busy looking after her baby sister. Millie Molly Mandy went off to the woods with just Toby the dog to find some. When she was busy looking, she heard a loud chirping noise and Millie Molly Mandy said to herself, I wonder what sort of bird that is. And then she found a ripe blackberry and forgot about the chirping noise. And after a time, Millie Molly Mandy said to herself, how that bird does keep on chirping. And then Toby found a rabbit hole and Millie Molly Mandy forgot all about the chirping noise again. After some more time, Millie Molly Mandy said to herself, that bird sounds as though it wants something. And then Millie Molly Mandy went towards a brambly clearing in the wood from which the chirping noise seemed to come. But when she got there, the chirping noise didn't seem to come from a tree, but from a low bramble bush. And when she got to the low bramble bush, the chirping noise stopped. Millie Molly Mandy thought that it was because it was frightened of her. So she said out loud, it's all right. Don't be frightened. It's only me. Just as kindly as she could. And then she poked in among the bramble bush. She couldn't find anything except thorns. And then, quite suddenly, lying on the grass on the other side of the bramble bush, Millie Molly Mandy and Toby the dog together found what had been making all that chirping noise. It was so frightened that it had rolled itself into a tiny little prickly ball, no bigger than a penny India rubber ball, which Millie Molly Mandy had bought at Mrs. Muggins' store the day before. For what do you think it was? A tiny little weeny baby hedgehog! Millie Molly Mandy was excited, and so was Toby the dog. Millie Molly Mandy had to say, no, Toby, be quiet, Toby, very firmly indeed. And then she picked up the baby hedgehog in a bracken leaf, because it was a very prickly baby, though it was so small. And she could just see its little soft nose quivering among its prickles. And then Millie Molly Mandy looked about for, to find its nest, for of course she didn't want to take it away from its family, but she couldn't find it. And then the baby began squeaking again for its mother, but its mother didn't come. So at last, Millie Molly Mandy said comfortingly, Never mind, darling. I'll take you home and look after you. So Millie Molly Mandy carried the baby hedgehog between her two hands very carefully, and it unrolled itself a bit and quivered its little soft nose over her fingers as if they hoped it might be good to eat. And it squeaked and squeaked because it was very hungry. So Millie Molly Mandy hurried all she could, and Toby the dog capered along at her side, and at last they got home to the nice white cottage with the thatched roof. Father and mother and grandpa and grandma and uncle and auntie were all very interested indeed. Mother put a saucer of milk on the stove to warm, and then they tried to feed the baby. But it was too little to lap from a saucer, and it was too little even to lick from Millie Molly Mandy's finger. So at last they had to wait until it opened its mouth to squeak and then squirt drops of warm milk into it with father's fountain pen filler. And after that the baby felt a bit happier and Millie Molly Mandy made a nest in a little box of hay. But when she w put it in it squeaked and squeaked again for its nice warm mother till Millie Molly Mandy put her hand in the box and then it snuggled up against it and went to sleep. And Millie Molly Mandy stood there and chuckled softly to herself because it felt so funny being mistaken for Mrs. Hedgehog. She quite liked it. When father and grandpa and uncle came in to dinner, the baby woke and began squeaking again. So uncle picked it up in his big hand to have a look at it while Millie Molly Mandy, Mandy ran for more milk and the fountain pen filler. And then the baby squeaked so loudly that uncle said, Hello, Horace, what's all this noise about? And Millie Molly Mandy was pleased because Horace 
just seemed to suit the baby hedgehog, and no one knew what its mother had named it, but I don't suppose it was Horace. Milly Molly Mandy kept very busy all that day, feeding Horace every hour or two. He was so prickly that she had to wrap him round in an old handkerchief first, and he looked the funniest little baby in a white shawl you ever did see. When bedtime came, Milly Molly Mandy wanted to take the hedgehog's box up to her little room with her, but Mother said no, he would be all right in the kitchen till morning. So they gave him a hot bottle. They gave him a hot bottle to snuggle against. It was an ink bottle wrapped in flannel. And then Milly Molly Mandy went off to bed. But being mother, even to a hedgehog, is a very important sort of job. And in the night, Milly Molly Mandy woke up and thought of Horace and wondered if he felt lonely in his new home. And she creepy crept to the top in the dark to the top of the stairs and listened. And after a time, she heard a tiny little squeak squeak coming from the kitchen. So she hurried and pulled on her dressing gown and her bedroom slippers. And then she hurried and creepy crept into the dark downstairs in the kitchen and carefully lit the candle on the dresser. And then she fed Horace and talked to him in a comfortable whisper so that he didn't feel lonely anymore. And then she put him back to bed and blew out the candle and creepy crept in the dark upstairs to her own little bed. And it did feel so nice and warm to get into again. The next day, Horace learned to open his mouth when he felt the fountain pillar touch it the fountain pen filler touch it. He couldn't see it because his eyes weren't opened yet, just like a baby puppy or kitten. And just soon as he learned to suck away at the filler, just as if it were a proper baby's bottle. And he grew and he grew and in a week's time his eyes were open. And as soon as he grew, little teeth and could gobble bread and milk out of an egg cup and sometimes a bit of meat or a banana. He was quite a little boy hodgehog. He was quite a little boy hedgehog now, instead of a little baby one, and Milly Molly Mandy didn't need to get up in the night any more to feed him. Milly Molly Mandy was very proud of him, and when little friend Susan used to say she had to hurry home after school to look after her baby sister, Milly Molly Mandy used to say that she had to hurry too to look after the baby Horace. She used to give him walks in the garden and laugh at his funny little back legs and tiny tail as he waddled about, nosing the ground. When Toby the dog barked, he would roll himself up into a prickly ball in a second, but he soon came out again and would rub to Millie Molly Mandy's hand when she called Horace. He was quite happy with her for a mother. One day, Horace got out of his hay box in the kitchen, and they couldn't find him for a long time, though they all looked. Father and mother and grandpa and grandma and uncle and auntie and Millie Molly Mandy, but at last, where do you think they found him? In the larder. Well, said Uncle, Horace knows how to look after himself all right now. And after that, Horace's bed was put out in the barn, and Millie Molly Mandy would take his little basin of bread and milk out to him and then stay and play till it got too chilly. And then one frosty morning, they couldn't find Horace anywhere, though they all looked, father and mother and grandpa and grandma and uncle and auntie and Millie Molly Mandy. But at last, a day or two after, grandpa was pulling out some hay for the pony Twinkletoes. What do you think he found? A little ball of prickles curled, cuddled up deep in the hay. Horace had gone to sleep for the winter, like the proper little hedgehog that he was. Grandpa said that that sort of going to sleep was called hibernating. So Millie Molly Mandy put the hay with the prickly ball inside it into a large box in the barn, with a little bowl of water nearby in case Horace should wake up and want a drink. And there she left him sleeping soundly while the cold winds blew and the snows fell, until he should wake up in the spring and come out to play with her again. And that's a true story. Chapter 17 Millie Molly Mandy goes on an expedition. Once upon a time, it was a Monday bank holiday. Millie Molly Mandy had been looking forward to this Monday bank holiday for a long time, more than a week, for she and Billy Blunt had been planning to go for a long fishing expedition that day. It was rather exciting. They were to get up very early and take their dinners with them, and their rods and their lines and jam jars, and go off all on their own along by the brook, and not be back until quite late in the day. Millie Molly Mandy went to bed the night before with all the things she wanted for the expedition arranged beside her bed, a new little tin mug to drink out of, and a bottle for drinking water, and a large packet of bread and butter and an egg and a banana for her dinner, and a jam jar to carry the fish in, and a little green fishing net to catch them with, and some string and a safety pin, which is always useful to have and her school satchel to put things in. For when you are going off for the whole day, you do want quite a lot of things with you. 
When Millie Molly Mandy woke up on the Monday bank holiday morning, she thought to herself, oh dear, it is a gray sort of day. I do hope it isn't going to rain. But anyhow, she knew she was going to enjoy herself. And she jumped up and washed and dressed and put on her hat and the satchel strap over her shoulder. And then the sunshine came creeping over the trees outside. And Millie Molly Mandy saw that it had only been a gray day because she was up before the sun. And she felt a sort of little skip inside because she was so very sure she was going to enjoy herself. And then there came a funny, gritty sound, like a handful of earth on the window pane. And when she had put her head out, there was Billy Blunt eating a large piece of bread and butter and grinning up at her, looking very businesslike, with rod and line and jam jar and bulging satchel. Millie Molly Mandy called out of the window in a loud whisper, Isn't it a lovely day? I'm just coming. And Billy Blunt called back in a loud whisper, Come on, hurry up, it's getting late. So Millie Molly Mandy hurried up like anything and picked up her things and ran creeping downstairs past father and mother's room and grandpa and grandma's room and uncle and auntie's room and she filled up her bottle at the tap in the scullery and took up a thick slice of bread and butter which mother had left between two plates ready for her breakfast and unlocked the back door and slipped out into the fresh morning air. And there they were, off on their Monday bank holiday expedition. Isn't it lovely, said Millie Molly Mandy, with a little hop. Um, come on, said Billy Blunt. So they went off out of the back gate and across the meadow to the brook, walking very businesslike and enjoying their bread and butter very thoroughly. We'll go that way, said Billy Blunt, because that's the way we don't generally go. And when we come to a nice place, we'll fish, said Millie Molly Mandy. But that won't be for a long way yet, said Billy Blunt. So they went on walking very businesslike. They had eaten their bread and butter by this time, until they had left the nice white cottage with the thatched roof a long way behind, and the sun was shining down quite hotly. It seems like a real expedition when you have the whole day to do it in, doesn't it? said Millie Molly Mandy. I wonder what time it is now. Not time for dinner yet, said Billy Blunt, but I could eat it. So could I, said Millie Molly Mandy. Let's have a drink of water. So they each had a little tin mug full of water and drank it very preciously to make it last, as the bottle didn't hold much. The brook was too muddy and too weedy for drinking, but it was an interesting brook. One place where it had gotten rather blocked up was just full of tadpoles. They caught ever so many with their hands and put them in the jam jars and watched them swim about and wiggle their little black tails and open and shut their little black mouths. Then farther on were lots of stepping stones in the stream and Millie Molly Mandy and Billy Blunt had a fine time scrambling about from one to another. Billy Blunt slipped once, with one foot in the water, so he took off his boots and socks and tied them round his neck. And it looked so nice that Millie Molly Mandy took off one boot and sock and tried it too. But the water and the stones were so cold that she put them on again and just tried to be fairly careful how she went. But even so, she slipped once and caught her frock on a branch and pulled the button off and had to fasten it together with a safety pin. So wasn't it a good thing that she had brought one with her? Presently, they came to a big, flat, mossy stone beside the brook, and Millie Molly Mandy said, that's where we ought to eat our dinners, isn't it? I wonder what time it is now. Billy Blunt looked round and considered, and then he said, somewhere about noon, I should say. Might think about eating soon, as we had breakfast early. Less to carry, too. Millie Molly Mandy said, let's spread it all out ready anyhow. It's a lovely place here. So they laid the food out on the flat stone with the bottle of water and the little tin mug in the middle. And it looked so good and they felt so hungry that of course they just had to set to and eat it all up straight away. And it did taste nice. And the little black tadpoles in the glass jam jars beside them swam round and round and wriggled their little black tails and opened and shut their little black mouths till at last Millie Molly Mandy said, we've taken them away from their dinners, haven't we? Let's put them back now. And Millie, Billy Blunt said, yes, we'll want the pots for real fishes soon. So they emptied the tadpoles back into the brook, where they wiggled away at once to their meals. Look, there's a fish, cried Millie Molly Mandy, pointing. And Billy Blunt hurried and fetched his rod and line and settled to fishing in real earnest. Millie Molly Mandy went a little farther downstream and poked about with her net in the water. And soon she caught a fish and put it in her jam jar and ran to show it to Billy Blunt. And Billy Blunt said, huh. But he said it wasn't proper fishing without a rod and a line, so it didn't really count. Millie Molly Mandy liked it quite well that way, all the same. So 
they fished and they fished along the banks and sometimes they saw quite big fish two or three inches long and Billy Blunt got quite excited and borrowed Millie Mally Mandy's net and they got a number of fish into their jam jars oh don't you wish we'd just brought our teas too so we could stay here for a long long time said Millie Molly Mandy um said Billy Blunt we ought to have done expect we'll have to be getting back soon so at last they got hungry and thirsty too, having finished all of the bottle of water. So they began to pack up their things, and Billy Blunt put on his socks and boots, and they tramped all the way back, scrambling up and down the banks and jumping the stepping stones. When they got home, Millie Molly Mandy... When they got near home, Millie Molly Mandy said doubtfully, What about our fishes? And Billy Blunt said, We don't really want them now, do we? We only wanted a fishing expedition. So they counted how many there were, there were fifteen, and then emptied them back into the brook where they darted off at once to their meals. Millie Molly Mandy and Billy Blunt went on up through the meadow to the nice white cottage with the thatched roof, feeling very hungry and hoping that they weren't too badly late for tea. And when they got in, father and mother and grandpa and grandma and uncle and auntie were all sitting at the table, just finishing, why, what do you think? Why, their midday dinner! Billy Molly Mandy and Billy Blunt couldn't think how it had happened, but when you get up so very early to go on fishing expeditions and get so very hungry, well, it is rather difficult to reckon the time properly. Chapter 18, Milly Molly Mandy Helps to Thatch a Roof Once upon a time, it was a very blustery night, so very blustery that it woke Milly Molly Mandy right up several times. Milly Molly Mandy's little attic bedroom was just under the thatched roof, so she could hear the wind blowing in the thatch, as well as rattling her little low window and even shaking her door. Millie Molly Mandy had to pull the bedclothes well over her ears to shut out some of the noises before she could go to sleep at all, and so did father and mother and grandpa and grandma and uncle and auntie in their bedrooms. It was so very blustery. And the next morning, when Millie Molly Mandy woke up properly, the wind was still very blustery, although it didn't sound quite so loud as it had in the dark. Millie Molly Mandy sat up in her little bed, thinking what a noisy night it was. And then she looked towards her little low window to see if it was raining. What do you think she saw? Why, lots of long bits of straw dangling and swaying just outside from the edge of the thatched roof above. And when she got up and looked out of her little low window, she saw, why, lots of long bits of straw lying all over the grass and all over the flower beds and all over the hedge. Millie Molly Mandy stared round, thinking, It's been raining straw all night. And then she thought some more. And suddenly she said right out loud, Oh, the wind's blown our nice thatched roof off. Then Millie Molly Mandy didn't want to think any longer, but ran barefoot into mother and father's room, calling out, Oh, father and mother, the wind's blowing our nice thatched roof off, and it's lying all over the garden. Then father jumped out of bed and put his boots on his bare feet and his big coat over his pajamas and ran outside to look. And mother jumped out of bed and wrapped the down quilt round Millie Molly Mandy and went with her to her window to look, but there wasn't really anything to see from there. Then father came back to say that one corner of the thatched roof was being blown off and it would have to be seen to immediately before it got any worse. And then everybody began to get dressed. Millie Molly Mandy thought it was kind of funny to have breakfast just the same as usual while the roof was blowing off. She felt very excited about it and ate her porridge nearly all up before she even remembered beginning it. When shall you see to the roof? asked Millie Molly Mandy. Directly after breakfast? And father said, yes, it must be seen to as soon as possible. How will you see to it? asked Millie Molly Mandy. With a long ladder? And father said, no. It's too big a job for me. We must send to Mr. Critch the thatcher, and he'll bring a long ladder and mend it. Millie Molly Mandy felt sorry that father couldn't mend it himself, but it would be nice to see Mr. Critch the thatcher mend it. Directly after breakfast, Auntie put her hat on and coat and went down to the village with a message, and Millie Molly Mandy put on her hat and coat and went with her because she wanted to see where Mr. Critch the thatcher lived. And as they went out of the gate, the wind got another little bit of thatch loose on the roof and blew it down at them, so they hurried as fast as they could, along the white road with the hedges on each side, down to the village. But when Mi Auntie knocked at Mr. Critch the Thatcher's door, he lived in one of the little cottages just by the pond where the ducks were. 
Mrs. Critz, the thatcher's wife, opened it, and her apron blew about like a flag. It was so windy. And Mrs. Critch, the thatcher's wife, said she was so very sorry, but Mr. Critch had just gone off in a hurry to mend another roof, and she knew he would not be able to come to them for a couple of days at the earliest, because he was so rushed, what with all this wind and all, said Mrs. Critch. Dear, dear, said Auntie, whatever shall we do? Mrs. Critch was sorry, but she did not know what they could do, except wait until Mr. Critch could come. Oh, dear, dear, said Auntie, and meantime our roof will be getting worse and worse. Then Auntie and Millie Molly Mandy said good morning to Mrs. Critch and went out through the little gate into the road again. Father will have to mend it now, won't he, Auntie, said Millie Molly Mandy. It isn't at all easy to thatch a roof, said Auntie. You have to know how. I wonder what we can do. They set off back home along the white road with the hedges each side, and Auntie said, well, there must be a way out somehow. And Millie Molly Mandy said, I expect father will know what to do. So they hurried along, holding their hats on. As they passed the Moggs' cottage, they saw little friend Susan trying to hang a towel on the line, with the wind trying all the time to wrap her up in it. Millie Molly Mandy called out, hello, Susan, our roof's being blown off, and Mr. Critch the Thatcher can't come and mend it, so father will have to. Do you want to come and see? Little friend Susan was very interested, and as soon as she had got the towel up, she came along with them. When father and mother and grandpa and grandma and uncle and auntie heard the news, they all looked as if they were saying dear, dear to themselves. But Millie Molly Mandy looked quite pleased and said, now you'll have to mend the roof, won't you, father? And father looked at uncle and said, well, Joe, how about it? And uncle said, right, John, in his big voice. And then father and uncle buttoned their jackets so that the wind shouldn't flap them and fetched ladders to reach the roof with, and to a rake to comb the straw tidy with, and wooden pegs with which to fasten it down. And then they put one ladder so they could climb up to the thatched roof, and another ladder with hooks on the end so that they could climb up on the thatched roof. And then Father gathered up a big armful of straw, and he and Uncle set to work busily to mend the hole in the thatch as well as they could, till Mr. Critch the thatcher could come. Millie Molly Mandy and little friend Susan down below set to work busily to collect the straw from the hedges and the flower beds and the grass, piling it up in one corner ready for father when he came down for another armful, and they helped to hold the ladder steady, and handed up sticks for making the pattern round the edge of the thatch, and fetched things that father or uncle called out for, and were very useful indeed. Soon the roof began to look much better. Then father fetched a big pair of shears, and he snip, snip, snipped, the draggly ends of the straw all round Millie Molly Mandy's little bedroom window up under the roof. Millie Molly Mandy thought it was just like the nice white cottage having its hair cut. And then father and uncle stretched a big piece of wire netting all over the mended place and fastened it down with pegs. Millie Molly Mandy thought it was just like the nice white cottage having a hairnet put on and fastened with hairpins. And then the roof was all trim and tidy again and they wouldn't feel any sort of hurry for Mr. Critch the Thatcher to come and thatch it properly. Isn't it a lovely roof, said Millie Molly Mandy. I knew father could do it. Well, you can generally manage to do a thing when you have to, Millie Molly Mandy, said father, but he looked quite pleased with himself, and so did uncle. And when they saw what a nice snug roof they had now, so did mother and grandpa and grandma and auntie and Millie Molly Mandy. We have time for one more, and this is my favorite of all the Millie Molly Mandy stories. Chapter 19, Millie Molly Mandy Keeps House. Once upon a time, Millie Molly Mandy was left one evening in the nice white cottage with the thatched roof to keep house. There was something called a political meeting being held in the next village. Millie Molly Mandy didn't know quite what that meant, but it was something to do with voting, which was something you had to do when you grew up. And father and mother and grandpa and grandma and uncle and auntie all thought they ought to go. Millie Molly Mandy said that she would not mind one bit being left, especially if she could have little friend Susan in to keep her company. So mother said, very well then, Millie Molly Mandy, we'll have little friend Susan in to keep you company, and you needn't open the door if anyone knocks unless you know who it is, and I'll leave you out some supper in case we may be getting a, back a little late. Little friend Susan was only too pleased to come and spend the evening with Millie Molly Mandy. So after tea she came in, and then father and mother and grandpa and grandma and uncle and auntie put on their hats and coats and said goodbye and went off. And Millie Molly Mandy and little friend Susan shut the door carefully after them, 
and then they were all by themselves keeping house. What fun, said little friend Susan, what do we do? Well, said Millie Molly Mandy, if we're housekeepers, I think we ought to wear aprons. So they each tied on one of mother's aprons. And then a little friend Susan said, now if we've got our aprons on, we ought to work. So Millie Molly Mandy fetched a dustpan and brush and swept up some crumbs from the floor and little friend Susan folded the newspaper that was lying all anyhow by Grandpa's chair and put it neatly on the shelf. And then they banged the cushions and straightened the chairs, feeling very housekeeperish indeed. Then little friend Susan looked at the plates of bread and drippings on the table with the jug of milk and two little mugs, and she said, what's that for? And Millie Molly Mandy said, that's for our supper, but it isn't time to eat yet. Mother says we can warm the milk on the stove if we like in a saucepan. What fun, said little friend Susan, then we'll be cooks. Couldn't we do something to the bread and dripping too? So Millie Molly Mandy looked at the bread and dripping thoughtfully and then she said, we could toast it at the fire. Oh yes, said little friend Susan. And then she said, oughtn't we begin to doing it? Oughtn't we to begin doing it now? It does take quite a long time to cook things. So Millie Molly Mandy said, let's, and fetched a saucepan, and little friend Susan took up the jug of milk, and then suddenly, bang, 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 went the door knocker, ever so loudly. Ooh, said little friend Susan, that did make me jump. I wonder who it is. Ooh, said Millie Molly Mandy, we mustn't open the door unless we know. I wonder who it can be. So together they went to the door, and Millie Molly Mandy put her mouth to the letterbox and said politely, please, who are you, please? Nobody spoke for a moment, and then a funny sort of voice outside said very gruffly, I'm Mr. Snooks. And directly they heard that, Millie Molly Mandy and little friend Susan looked at each other and said both together, It's Billy Blunt! And then they unlocked the door and pulled it open, and there was Billy Blunt standing grinning on the doorstep. Millie Molly Mandy held the door wide for him to come in and said, Did you think that we didn't know you? Little friend Susan said, you did give us a jump. And Billy Blunt came in, grinning all over his face. We're all alone, said Millie Molly Mandy. We're keeping house. Look at our aprons, said little friend Susan. We're going to cook our suppers. Come on, said Millie Molly Mandy, and we'll give you some. May you stop? Billy Blunt let them pull him into the kitchen, and then he said that he'd seen father and mother and grandpa and grandma and uncle and auntie as they went past the corn shop to the crossroads, and Mother had told him that they were alone, and that he could go and have a game with them if he liked, so he thought he'd come and give them a jump. Take off your coat, because it's hot in here, said Millie Molly Mandy. Now we must go get on with the cooking. Come on, Susan. So they put the milk into the saucepan on the back of the stove, and then they each took a piece of bread and dripping on a fork to toast it. But it wasn't a very good toasting fire, or else there were too many people trying to toast at the same time. Billy Blunt began to think it was rather long to wait, and he looked at the frying pan on the side of the stove, in which Mother always cooked the bacon for breakfast, and said, why not put him in there and fry him up? Millie Molly Mandy and little friend Susan thought that was a splendid idea, so they flied, fried all the bread and dripping nice and brown, and it did smell good. And when they had done it, there was just a little fat left in the pan, so they looked round for something else to cook. I'll go and see if there's any odd bits of bread in the bread crock, said Millie Molly Mandy. We mustn't cut any, because I'm not allowed to use the bread knife yet. So she went into the scullery to look, and there were one or two dry pieces of bread in the bread crock. But then she found something else, and that was a big basket of onions. Then Millie Molly Mandy gave a little squeal, because she had a good idea. And she took out a small onion, she knew she might, because they had lots and father grew them, and ran back into the kitchen with it. And Billy Blunt, with his scout's knife, peeled and sliced it into the pan, and the onions made him cry like anything. And then Millie Molly Mandy fried it on the stove, and the onions made her cry like anything. And then little friend Susan, who didn't want to be out of any fun, stirred it up with her head well over the pan. And the onions made her cry like anything, too. Well, at least, she managed to get one small tear out. And the onions smelt most delicious all over the kitchen, only it would seem to cook all black or else not at all. But you th can't think how good it tasted, spread on slices of fried bread. They all sat on the hearth rug before the, before the fire, with plates on their laps and mugs by their sides, and divided everything as evenly as possible. And they only wished there was more of everything, for of course Mother hadn't thought of Billy Blunt when she cut the bread and drippings. 
When they had just finished the last crumb, the door opened and father and mother and grandpa and grandpa and uncle and auntie came in and they all said together, whatever's all this smell of fried onions? So Millie Molly Mandy explained, and when mother had looked at the frying pan to see that it wasn't burnt, and it wasn't, she only laughed and opened the windows. And father said, well, this smell makes me feel very hungry. Can't we all have some fried onions for supper too, mother? And then, before father took little friend Susan and Billy Blunt home, mother gave them all a piece of currant cake with which to finish their supper. And then she started frying a pan full of onions for the grown-up supper. And Millie Molly Mandy, when she had said goodbye to little friend Susan and Billy Blunt, watched Mother very carefully th so that she should know how to fry quite properly next time she was left to keep house. You have been listening to A Book at Bedtime, a Story Ranger Presents production. Thank you so much for your continued support of the show. I hope that I am bringing you some amount of levity, distraction, and enjoyment uh, during this global crisis. And have a great night, everyone!